<laughs> Hi, I'm Cam Vedbrat. I'm a lead program manager on the Windows client team. Yeah. And uh, I've got some cool graphic stuff to show you here. Now, I heard you're the interface guy. Uh, from a program management perspective, a little bit, yeah. Okay. I, um, I was the lead program manager uh, for two years on the Arrow effort, doing working with uh, the design team to do the redesign of the user interface. And then about a year ago, I moved over to Avalon to help build part of it. Wow. So. Now, Arrow, do they still call it Arrow? Uh, or do they just call it the glass interface or, or something like that? Uh, we, we still use the word Arrow quite a bit. Um, okay. Arrow, it's, a, it's an acronym. Uh, it stands for Authentic, Energy, Reflective, and Open. And that was kind of a set of keywords that we got to at the end of the creative exercise we did going on two years ago now. Yeah. Um, and um, Was this the so creative we, we talked before about a year and a, what, a year and a half ago or something like yeah, that? Yeah, a little while back. And you talked about studying uh, really nice sports cars. And well, we, studied, <laughs> we didn't study sports cars, but we studied quite a few things, not just yeah. sports cars. Um, we looked at all kinds of devices and consumer products and everything from potato peelers to um, clothing to uh, electronics, really kind of try to get a good, broad brush look at sort of the design landscape. Um, and the design team did did a heck of a job with that. Like, I, I'm so happy to have worked with probably the best design team in the company. So what, what's so cool Maybe about... the best design team <coughs> in the industry. What's so cool about it, Era? What, what's your mom going to notice when she first starts up Windows Vista or takes a look at it at Best Buy or Fry's or something like that? So uh, there's probably two <coughs> things that uh, I think Sorry. she'd notice. And... Um, yeah, we can we can shoot your screen. Yeah, how about not the crash dialogue? <laughs> well, it is it is a uh, you know a was, new term built. You know, this is a in in fairness, it was Outlook crashing. So, <laughs> um, so I think mom will notice a few things. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I think she'll notice is that everything is just smoother. Um, we spent a great deal of time trying to just reduce the number of jarring things that happen in the experience and make sure that. Things just feel very streamlined, very efficient uh, when you, Can you use them. Can you give me them. an example of that? And so uh, one, one example is just when windows open and close, they come up in a much smoother way. So let's open calculator. And yep. should we do that again? Yeah. It's so little things like when I open a window. So if I open calculator, it comes up very smoothly. It doesn't just pop in your face like that. Um, even, even more subtle things, actually, if you get really close on the um, minimize, maximize, and close buttons, you can see how they kind of light up and they fade. You can't actually maximize calculator, so that one doesn't yeah. doesn't light up. But they fade very smoothly, and the the light actually goes outside the region of the window. We're just trying to get very realistic with these things right. and just very smooth, very efficient. Um, another example of that is the way that we use this kind of transparency in the uh, in the window frames. It it gives us the ability to have larger window frames, so the click target here on the edges is much bigger. So now resizing and moving windows becomes easier. But because it's transparent, it doesn't feel heavy. Yeah. So if I had that big blue Windows XP window border around it, it would you know it would feel like a very heavy kind of thing. But like this, it, it ends up feeling very lightweight, and customers really seem to seem to be excited and feel good about that when they when they use it. Can you uh, drag it over something just so we can see so, what happens? Yeah, let's let's do that. So actually here, why don't I drag this one? This one has a little bit more glass in it. And you'll see this this is Windows Explorer. And he actually has glass in the client area, not just in the um, not just in the frame of the window. And that's exposed through through an API that any developer will actually be able to use. So developers can have glass in their applications as and well. Dra drag it around so people And so if you look over calculator and you can see how it kind of blurs what's going on in the background there. That's pretty neat. But What's even more neat than that is if I start a video playing, this is a video I downloaded from uh, Microsoft.com that's a trailer for a game that's coming out on Xbox 2. So is this, uh, this is uh, Project Gotham Racing. Project Gotham. But watch what happens to the video under the trailer. Like The video is actually blurry as well. And we're able to do that blur in real time because we're doing this on a graphics card. Wow. So, so how hard technically cool was that to do? Incredibly. <laughs> um, well, how many lines what? of code was killed <laughs> to oh, do boy. that? I, I couldn't tell you how many lines of code it was. <laughs> the the challenge is, you, we've we've made sort of a fundamental change in how the desktop is drawn uh, for Windows Vista, and this is a big deal. What what we did was instead of just having User and GDI draw the desktop, User and GDI are still in the um, in the graphic stack, applications still use them, and they're, they're great technologies. They've been the sort of cornerstone for user interface yeah. in Windows for over 20 years now. 
but we have this great new technology that we've been developing for I guess almost 10 years called DirectX yep. and DirectX lets us take advantage of all the rich innovation that's been going on in the hardware space over the last uh, five to ten years. And Simplified, the, the graphics in the old world are drawn by the Intel processor, the main, main motherboard processor. No, that's not true. Oh, really? That's not true. Okay. Um, the, the way it works is your graphics processor has two portions to it. It has a GDI accelerator okay. and it has a D3D accelerator. And um, now, you, if you had just plain Super VGA going and you didn't install a graphics driver, then all the rendering instructions would happen in software. But very few customers run like that. Yep. Um, and, and in that scenario, the last blit to the screen would be the only thing that happened in hardware. But uh, that's a very rare case. Most people have a modern card, either it's a discrete card or it's Intel's graphics accelerator or it's another embedded um, integrated graphics part. I think all the big IHVs make them now. Um, and and those will hardware accelerate the GDI pipeline as well as the D3D pipeline. Okay. So what we've done is, the, the thing is, GDI hasn't changed. And so the amount of innovation in GDI and innovation in the hardware hasn't been really a focus for anybody on that portion of the silicon. All the excitement has happened in the 3D space largely around gaming and to a certain degree around larger desktop applications, things like CAD, medical imaging, heavy industrial kind of, maybe not heavy, but yeah. bigger maybe, uh, and the other area where you see it is amongst uh, creative professionals with applications like Maya and uh, 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 3D Studio Max, that kind of thing. Uh, so the the graphics pipeline is is just been exploding in terms of power and what we're doing here is we're basically changing how graphics work so right. now the desktop every every window will draw to a software surface using software GDI actually in that in the in the model that very few people run today and then what we do is we compose the desktop by grabbing those surfaces in software converting them to textures they're, we're using a, a new technology called shared surfaces that is part of the new driver model for Windows Vista. Uh, and, and we convert them into textures and then we use them in a 3D scene to render the desktop. So now the desktop is being rendered by D3D. Now Windows Presentation Foundation, which is our new user interface graphics presentation platform formerly that's known as Avalon. formerly known as Avalon, yep. that's part of WinFX, all the drawing that happens using WPF all happens on the graphics card as well. So when you now out of the box, brand new, you know, if you install an old version of Office or any existing Win32 application yeah. today, it'll work, but it'll use the GDI pipeline. As new applications come up that start using WPF, you're gonna see Windows move to a world where the entire desktop is rendered as vectors uh, in in a three in, using the three D pipeline in a much richer way. Yeah. And what that does is that really kind of opens the door to a lot more rich lively, interesting, engaging experiences uh, and just a, a, a more expressive product yeah. that I think customers will be able to connect to a lot a lot more easily and I think it'll just enable uh, better user interfaces across the oh, board. Yeah. I, I was playing at the PDC they're showing off a couple of demos and uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk, well yeah let's talk about uh, a couple of them, one was uh, from North Face and yeah uh, that's pretty cool you know really immersive with multiple videos spinning around yeah, that you can click on that then they animate and and while they're playing they come up to the surface and, yep very, and very much so you can do all kinds of stuff with this i mean it's in a lot of ways that this might be a little too um uh, this might be a little too proud but in, in a lot of ways i think about avalon like creating fire Right, and there's 400 people who came together, four or 500 people, quite a few, who who came together over the last four years to make Avalon and to make the platform that the desktop is using and the next generation of applications are going to use. And the thing about Fire is, it's incredibly useful. But I think that the caveman who created Fire, he didn't know about Apollo, he didn't know about internal combustion, he didn't know about any of the uses. He just wanted to stay warm and. And I love that North Face demo. It is beautiful. But I do kind of get the feeling that that's just keeping warm. 
and and it is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the richness that we're going to be able to deliver in the PC over the next 10 years on this platform. Yeah. So very powerful stuff. What else? Uh, what else do you think? Uh, a normal end user, you know. So I think a normal end user is going to see a lot of cool stuff here. <laughs> so uh, it's smoother. Uh, one of the other things that, that we've done is because we're keeping copies of the Windows output in GDI, what we can do is we don't actually have to bring applications back into the system in order to, uh, or back into memory and page them onto the processor in order to get them to paint. So as I move this window over the window behind it, the windows behind it don't have to get invalidates and they don't have to repaint. And so the processing can stay on the window that is frontmost, which is a pretty good performance advantage. The other side effect is that if this window in the back was maybe, maybe it was talking to the network and maybe for some reason it hung because yeah. it, you know, blocking on the network transaction or doing oh, something the new, else. I, the, I just interviewed the networking guys. They say that one. <laughs> well, that'd be great. But you, you know they what? Like, the the it, networking stack underneath. It may not happen as a result of the networking stack, yeah. but you know, you can unplug the cable and yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're going to be stuck. Or the application could have been poorly written, in which case it could have been stuck or just something could have happened where the developer didn't anticipate it. But the nice thing is because we have a copy of that application's output, we can actually just draw it so it never looks broken the way it did. You don't get into the situation where one window is erasing the window behind it. Yeah. So just the level of sort of smoothness, reliability, robustness in the experience will be improved. The, hmm. the other thing we did is we, we spent a lot of time on making window management better for customers. And what we did some research recently where, this video is great, where we discovered that the average consumer rarely has more than four windows open at a time. Okay. And in fact, four windows is kind of a high-end thing for, for the average consumer, which was shocking to us because here at Microsoft, we open 25 windows, no problem. Yeah. And you start using Outlook, windows go everywhere. Uh, so it was kind of surprising when we dug into that, one of the things we discovered was that we've created a bunch of tools to make having lots of windows open easier for people, but it's still not as easy as it could be. We invented the taskbar in Windows 95, which is great. It has little buttons. So you can see the names of the windows. Yeah. But sometimes people don't see the taskbar. And sometimes they just don't know what window it is. And as the taskbar gets smaller and collapses, it gets harder to get from one window to the next. So one thing we did uh, in Vista using the new, 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 uh, the new graphics pipeline is we actually give you live previews of the window when you mouse over it on the taskbar. So as I go down here, you can see in the taskbar button that video keeps playing. And I can just, oh, there it goes, it stopped. Um, but I'll, let's bring it back, here's one, and here's another one, and the video is blank, and there it is, it's playing again. So you get that live view, you actually see the thing that you're looking for. And yeah. that's, uh, that's an element that is really kind of a big point of, um, pride for us when we think about the user experience in Vista. Your files are the file you're looking for, it's a picture of the file, and the window is the window you're looking for, really making it easier for people to really visualize and kind of cut through all the noise and clearly see what they're trying to get at. Right. Now you're playing with a, a pre-release version of Beta 2, right? Uh, yeah. So this is, um, this is a pre-release version of Beta 2, uh, and uh, this is uh, essentially the same uh, build as what uh, what will what will be handed out at PDC. It's a couple builds newer, but okay. more or less the same code. Cool. So there you can see the build number. <laughs> um, so it's it's a little bit newer, but N now are largely you, the same thing. Be honest. Are you holding back some UI? I am holding back a little. So because <laughs> I noticed the start bar and the and the uh, the bottom doesn't look as cool as as the top. Well, part. actually, <laughs> it, it does look pretty cool. Um, may, maybe you just haven't noticed, but one thing that we did uh, in the in the start menu is watch watch that taskbar and see what's going on under there. What, what like taskbar? right here. Oh, okay. See that video is playing through. The taskbar itself is glass as well, and it's very subtle. You don't you don't really notice it because it's tinted like that. But we're starting to take this kind of notion of keeping our UI as more of like a heads up display, more of a background element, and really trying to put it pervasive throughout the experience so that the thing that customers care about, their application, their content, that's what pops. That's what we want people to see. And our UI is there and it's important and it needs to be there so people can close a window and find a window. But at the end of the day, we don't want it overpowering the, the thing that they're doing. Okay. Um, so that's, that's kind of some cool stuff. There's uh, another thing that we did, which was we made so we made finding windows easier. We also made switching windows a lot more interesting. So one thing I can do because I've got D3D powering the experience is I can actually move my windows in 3D, Whoa. and I can cycle through them, and I can say I can roll the mouse wheel and just go to the window I want 
very so easily. Just show me your mouse. I'm just rolling the mouse wheel. Excellent. And uh, it's wireless, so we can have them together. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, and I can just pick a window and have it come to the forefront. I can go back into that mode and choose a different one. I can even slow it down if I want to show off how powerful my PC is to just kind of how did you do show that? off to my friends. I held down the shift key. And, uh, shift key while doing the mouse wheel? Well, while uh, bringing it out of the ah. animation. Okay. So this is a feature we call Flip 3D, and it lets you uh, flip through your windows in 3D. So yeah. kind of very simple name uh, for, for a very now, simple feature. Now, we're starting to see the beginning of a 3D interface, right? But you ha haven't gone crazy. You, we're not living in a 3D world with this new interface, right? No, no you're not. And th this is something that we get asked a lot. It's like, what? why isn't all of Windows in 3D? Let's make it all in 3D. We could. There's nothing stopping that. Uh, the technology's there. The creative juices are there. there. There's a couple reasons not to just dive in. The first is compatibility. And like all the applications that exist in Windows are designed to live on a 2D plane, and um, and that's an important thing. And and we want to make sure that we don't introduce weird scenarios that Windows can't cope with. For example, uh, there are APIs that let you select a window and get the screen coordinates of it. How do you make that API still work in a 3D space? Like so, there's challenges there. I, I'm not saying we wouldn't find a way. You know, you could you could do things like give it orthographic or flatten the space for the the API, but there's a set of compatibility issues you'd want to work through. And then the other thing we look at is how do we make the experience as usable as possible? Yeah. And the truth is, Windows itself, people spend a lot of time moving Windows around and doing stuff in the environment, but when they're in a window, it's really up to that application or that process to decide how its user interface should be presented. And there are some applications that are great for 3D. For example, um, this is something I, I downloaded off of uh, lego.com. This is my new favorite uh, Windows application. And um, it's uh, Lego Digital Designer. It's a D3D application. And it is taking its time to start up. Here we go. Uh, and it lets you basically uh, build a Lego set in, um, in a 3D space. And so I can you know, pick some Legos and move them around. And so I can see how for an application like this where you're really looking at a physical object, yeah. you would want a rich 3D interface. But even here, they spend a lot of time building their UI in two dimensions. This is a 2D yeah. area. And so I think what you'll see is a lot of kind of mixing of 2D and 3D together yeah. uh, in, in the interface. And in, in ways like I just showed you with the flip, like one thing that we do here is you still have a 2D presentation. It's a 3D uh, representation of your windows, but it's transformed into a 2D space on your desktop. Yeah. And this allows you to kind of be selective and not have to think about like, gosh, if I'm lining up two windows, how do I make sure their Z order is exactly right so I can see them next to each other at the same scale? Like, yeah. there's some risks around making it hard that I think we, we just wouldn't want to inflict yeah, on our it, customers. And you, yeah, you don't really appreciate that until you work with the customer support lines. I, I worked with a customer who could barely drag an icon from one folder to another. Exactly. Like, and so if you make it a, a 3D world, what are you going to do to users like that? You're right. going to really make things You, you just don't want to make things too hard. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing that we've done is uh, we've imp improved the traditional UI for window switching, um, and we've given it a name. So now we call that Flip. So we have Flip and Flip 3D. So Flip just lets you see the windows that you're cycling through in a kind of less immersive kind of flat thing. So if you just want to twitch and go from one window to the next, we can let you do that. But if you really kind of want to have a lot of windows open and you want to kind of sit back and say, all right, what am I trying to get to? You can do that as well. Yeah. So we, we kind of try to cater to both scenarios pretty well. Now, the best thing about this is all of the functionality here is exposed as API for developers. So developers can get this cool glass effect in the client area of their windows. Um, and here's a, an application that one of our interns on the test team wrote. Um, that actually just takes those same live previews. And actually, here, let me get out of this for just a moment so I can start the video playing so you can kind of see it live. Um, and this is an application that our, that our intern wrote that lets you take, take the live previews and just switch through them in a different way. And here, you know, he scales windows up and you can actually kind of see the one that's selected in here. And what he did was he grouped them by process. So if I have that, I can sort of cycle through them. So, and this is just an example of something that an intern put together. Uh, but the, the point of it is it really shows you that the sky is the limit in terms of 
building applications and really taking advantage of the graphics pipeline. And this is just one example. Yeah. I think the the North Face and some of the other things that uh, we showed at PDC will really kind of drive that home for people. Yeah. What else is cool? What else? I mean, is we, cool? we've seen the sh we met with the Shell team, so you know you don't have to go completely into the search stuff. Um, but what part did you did you guys did your team have anything to do with search integration or is that uh, completely well I, is that the shell team what, well when I worked on um, when I worked on the shell team uh, <laughs> you know I I was part of the UI team for that but uh, Avalon didn't spend a lot of time on search integration we really spent the focus of our time building a great developer platform okay and um, and and doing some just really powerful stuff for developers there yeah. Anything else you're really proud of, or any power power user tick trip <laughs> tricks or uh, tips? Uh, power user trip tick. Uh, <laughs> tricks power user. I got you doing it too. Tips. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think I've I've hit. Since the, you've been using it more than probably anybody in the I, company. I think I've hit the limit of them. Um, this thing is pretty cool. It's kind of addictive once you get once you get into it. Right. Being able and to what are you doing? What are the key commands you're doing? Um, do so right now it's Windows Tab gets you in. Windows Tab. Yeah, and then uh, the arrow keys cycle through them. Okay. And uh, the mouse cycles through it as well. We're going to change the uh, keyboard accelerators quite a bit, I and mean, this is something that we did just to kind of get it up and Working. running, but you'll see the keyboard accelerators kind of get refined a little more. One thing people have asked us for is making it so that you can have this more kind of a Twitch style interface um, in the 3D version as well. So maybe making it so that, you know, continually hitting the tab key would iterate, things like that. Right. We've got plenty of time to make sure the keyboard keyboard yeah. access. Tell right. me about the compositing engine a little bit more and what, what it does for, it, for you. Um, you. You've hinted at some things like if an app uh, hangs, it doesn't cause all the other windows to go well, away? It, it prevents windows from appearing hung. Uh, I, I mean, the app will be hung if it's hung, but it'll yeah. look better. And, and, and it'll help just with the overall perceived reliability of the system. Um, so when we think about composition, there's sort of, the, the way we position is we really say, you know, there's three buckets of, of functionality that we're delivering. The first is around visual quality. So making it so that things don't look like they're tearing and things don't look like they're hanging. Uh, the other thing that we can do actually, and I don't think this is implemented in this build, um, it may not be with the drivers, but um, we're actually able to sync the presentation of the display with the vertical sync of the monitor. So the tearing that you see when you move windows around will go away as a result of composition. That's a pretty big, pretty big win in terms of just overall smoothness. Um, so that's kind of the quality aspects of it. The what kind of hard that brings up a good point. What kind of hardware are you going to need to run this thing? Well, that's the million dollar question these days. Yeah. So, right now, we're this so this computer has kind of a beefy graphics card. We're running a Radeon X850 uh, with I think 256 megs of RAM. This is uh, of video memory. This is a pretty pretty beefy uh, pretty beefy dev machine we got here. Um, and you have a, a beautiful monitor too. Yeah, and there is a gorgeous <laughs> monitor there. Uh, there's a handful on the low end. Um, there's a handful of laptops we've seen that uh, we've worked with that, that run it pretty well um, on on kind of slower uh, or less expensive graphics parts. Uh, but we're kind of at the at the point where we're still doing a ton of performance tuning uh, on the product, and until we have a really solid sense of have we squeezed out every last microsecond. Uh, we're not going to really come out and say, hey, here's the exact hardware you need. Yeah. Um, just because it, it would be kind of a disservice to customers and to the vendors of that of that hardware to kind of set a bar somewhere that was going to change or, or was either too high or too low. When are, when um, are you guys going to have a good feel for that? Is that going to be a release candidate? or? I, I think closer to the end of the year we'll be in much better shape in terms of knowing exactly what's in sight and what's out of reach. But I mean, just to give you kind of a feel for it, one of our developers in the last three days found a way to reduce the amount of CPU time we move we take when we move a window from, from one place to another on the screen by 50%. So we're still kind of catching a lot of things and you know we'll get there but getting the performance to a point where we feel good about it and we feel like this is a good place to start benchmarking hardware against it is a very important goal for us and yeah I think by the end of the year we'll have a much better statement around that okay anything else cool that we should notice about the, the user interface or the user experience um, I think that's about it if you how about the startup screens did you start up and shut down screens did you guys do any work on that 
Uh, no, not yet. We're going to do a little bit of work to kind of smooth the transitions a little bit mm -hmm. um, further down the line. But right now, the, the startup and shutdown screens are pretty static. Um, I can show you a handful of Avalon stuff, but you're going to have to wait for me to boot my laptop. Oh. So it's up to you. Um, actually, we'll, uh, we have plenty of Avalon okay, stuff so coming. We won't so. do that then. Yeah. Um, and we'll we'll get maybe when you're at the PDC we we'll actually we're gonna get plenty of Avalon. Yeah, so. <laughs> All the guys who are doing those cool demos for uh, Will right. and Jim are that's gonna, true. They're it's gonna, gonna show that off. Um. So what else? Uh. Oh, I can show you one other thing. Uh. So I don't know if this is in the PDC build or not. Oh, take, take a risk. <laughs> All right. You might have to edit this. <laughs> um. The uh, the inbox games are a lot cooler. Okay. So this is this is kind of a fun thing that uh, the direct the DirectX team spent a bunch of time uh, making these games look a lot more gorgeous. And uh, so one thing that people have kind of used forever uh, is solitaire. It's the single most commonly played I, game. Uh, my on my dad bought a five thousand dollar Dell, and, and he all he did for the first two months is played solitaire. Yep. Oh, and wow. so if you look at it, you'll see it is drop dead gorgeous. Uh, and um, this. This is kind of really nice, and you can see it scales nicely. One of the things people always complained about Solitaire in the past was that when you scaled up the window, it didn't look very good. Yeah. Um, but we've done that with, uh, and let's exit without saving. We've done that with all the games, so Minesweeper is there. Um, you can see that, and he looks really nice. Same old Minesweeper, yeah. but just really nice makeover on it. Uh, and there's other games in the box now, Chess and uh, Shanghai, which is like a oh, yeah, game. and. Um uh, one of the developers, Adam Nathan, uh, gave us a video of uh, his uh, version of uh, Internet Hearts. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's beautiful. That's all pretty cool. I haven't seen that. It's all done that sounds Avalon. awesome. Yeah, the cards are really wild. Um, well, cool. We're looking forward to playing with this a little bit more. Yeah, I think, I think it'll, be, it'll be very exciting for people when they, when they get it. And we're looking at doing more uh, down the line as we, we get closer and closer to, to shipping. Yeah. So. Now, uh, one question I think I asked another team was: Is this skinnable? Can you know? Can I come up with a completely crazy look and feel from you know? If I'm a teenager and have a lot of time on my hands, can I make a Yu-Gi-Oh skin, skin or? Um. So, uh, it is and it isn't right. It depends on how much flexibility you really expect in your customization, and we've done a lot to make it so that the average person, the average customer can make the experience more their own through simple things like wallpaper and cursors and, and that sort of thing. And, and that's been in the product, I think, since Windows 95, forever we've had that stuff. Yeah. Um, but then there's also kind of a set of customers who want to go to the next level and want to change the title bar and change the buttons and, and that kind of thing. And, and the, the approach that we've taken there has been one that's, that's kind of a, a little bit two-sided. So the theme system and the window manager itself does not have any sort of hooks for, for skinning or, or anything like that. Uh, despite that, there are uh, some developers who have found ways to use public APIs to really customize the experience. Um, and, uh, and they've done some really interesting things. But at the end of the day, we don't see a huge, um, how do I put this? It's not a huge goal of ours to make it so that you can change the shape of the close button on every window in Windows. That doesn't mean that we don't want developers to be able to, for their applications, they will be able to have a great deal of flexibility, and I think Avalon is the kind of living example of that. Oh, yeah, we're going to um, see triangular shaped buttons. You're going to see everything. Star right? shaped buttons and 3D buttons, right? <laughs> like, you're going to see it all. Yeah. And, and that's great, and I, and I think that's kind of the place where we look at kind of really delivering value for our customers. Um, and, and I do think there's going to be a set of people who are going to want to go further, and there's a set of tools that you can download off the web that are distributed by third parties that let you get there. And, yeah. uh, and the community seems pretty happy with those tools. So, uh, so you know, more power to them. Yeah. Um, and what we kind of do at Microsoft, the way we think about it, is this is really about democratizing technology and making sure that the broad set, the 600 million people who pay for a Windows license, get things that they can all use. And so when we look to make ways for people to customize, um, we we try to really focus on that set of people. Yeah. You, you mentioned during the interview that you were holding some of the U, UI back for a release. Yeah. So how much of the UI have we seen? 80%? 90%? Oh, it's hard to put a number on it. Okay. Um, 
I think in terms of the the way a window looks, we're close. We're we're not totally done. There's a couple tricks we still have in our in our bag, but um, we're pretty close. Uh, but what you haven't seen is a lot of the changes that we're making in some of the richer end user functionality that's there. Uh, and you know, I mean, even in beta two, if I open up Internet Explorer, let's open up Internet Explorer. You know, you see some new stuff there, right? Like the tabs are there. There's some UI changes in that. Yeah. Um, Windows Explorer is getting better and better every day. But the the kind of richer inbox functionality that we have uh, on the media front uh, around sort of richer end user scenarios around like working with music, working with photos, working with some of those kinds of things, you'll see more of that as we get closer to the release. Yeah. So there's more to do. There's always more to do. Yep. Well, thank you for uh, spending some time with me and showing me the... Uh, My pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. It's always good to... Glad to get see to it after a year and a half of waiting. You know? I know. Well, we're getting there. <laughs> So thanks a lot and uh, good good job and hope to see it ship. Thank you. Soon. <laughs> thanks. Yep.